Well, if you look at what I believe, and I think what most people believe economic development is overall, it's the cooperation between government, businesses, and communities to raise the overall quality of life. So if you look at it that way, then we each have a role to play and we're equally important. You're listening to CRE Clarity, the show that guides you from confusion to clarity and sets you on the path to financial freedom faster. Learn how to grow your portfolio the right way with your host, CRE advisor, Jeremy Goodrich. Welcome to the CRE Clarity Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Goodrich. And on the show today, we have Jenny Massey. She is the Director of Site Selection at Sickitch Professional Services. We're really going to get into in this conversation today, the relationship between businesses and the properties they choose to put their business on. Jenny, super excited to have you. Thanks for taking the time to chat on our show today. Thank you so much. So dig in for us a little bit. A lot of our listeners, you know, we understand businesses when we drive by warehouses or industrial locations or even retail locations. We know that like some business decided somehow to end up at that spot. But what's really going there on there? Give us pull back the curtains a little bit for us on how that process works. As everyone knows, location is everything. So you have to choose the best location for your company. And every project that I work on, you know, goes back to what's most important for that particular company. Um, And every state has their things that they do well or the the things that they have going for them, right? The, The high points. So we tend to work with these companies. We give them a list and we say, okay, of this list of 50 things, what's most important to you? What are the absolute things that you must have? And that's kind of the basic, you know, site selection point. Rank your top 10. And then we start guiding from there. So on that list of 50, I mean, obviously we don't need all 50 things, but what are some of the top things that you're looking for? You just said location. I mean, location means a lot. You're in Indianapolis. You're in a large city, a primary city. That's going to be a big piece. What are some of the other pieces that are maybe under that? Sure. So you want to look at logistics look at highways and rail, those sorts of things. You're also looking at availability of workforce is a a very big thing. Water availability, power sources and availability. These days, you know, quality of life comes into it with a remote workforce. And those are just some of the things that come to top of mind. Okay, I'm starting to get a picture. We're thinking about all those elements. I would think that a lot of businesses kind of know where they want to be? How are you, where are businesses coming from that really aren't sure or are still trying to figure that out? Yeah, you're right. Most companies already, and I would say most companies have a presence in the United States. They kind of want to expand. They already know where they are and where they want to expand at. If they have a presence in the Midwest, do they probably want to go to the, the West Coast or they want to go East Coast? But it's, I work with a lot of international companies that are coming to the United States And they have no idea. They might know Chicago, they might know New York, and they might know California. And that's it. So the concept of Indiana or Ohio or Arkansas, they just don't have any idea. So that's the fun part is when you're like, oh, you know, let's really do a site search. Let's really find out. So if I'm an international investor, I know that I have a product, I have a widget of some kind, I want to sell it, and maybe I even want to have a manufacturing location in the United States so that I have easier transportation for the product that I'm creating. I would come to someone like you and and basically say, hey, drive me towards the right answer of where to set down this plant. Am I getting that right? Absolutely. Yes. You know, again, we're looking at those factors that are important. How much land do you need? How much power? How much water? Logistically, where your customers, where you're sending your product. But for me personally, I'm looking for low cost of doing business, low taxes. And where are you going to be friendly? Who's going to be friendly to me? Where is it going to be easy to get this done? 
barriers to market entry? How long is it going to take me to get approvals for the construction work for the, does anybody have incentives? Do you have infrastructure grants? Do you have job creation tax credits, investment tax credits, real personal property tax abatements, utility sales tax abatements? I mean, those credits and incentives are huge factors in where we locate. Now, I mean, let me tell you this, though. Location is most important. Incentives are like the icing on the cake. Okay, so I'm starting to get the picture here. So I want to put a factory somewhere. I want to do a manufacturing operation somewhere. I'm first going to say, okay, you know, some of the things you like logistics. Okay, well, do I have access to rail? If I need rail and I don't have access to rail, that's just a deal breaker, right? There are some things that are just truly deal breakers, correct? Yes, absolutely. So, okay, logistics is key. I'm thinking, all right, do I have availability of workforce? Are there people there? that have the skills and can do the work that I need them to do, that seems like second. What's the quality of life there? Are the people that are there going to be able to stay? Are they going to be happy to come to work or happy with the life that they live after they leave work so that they're more likely to stick around for a while? Do I have access to water and power? All those kinds of things. That's all location, essentially, right? That's the highest level of location. But then you get into the part that's really interesting. And we see this in the news sometimes if like a Tesla plant or a GE plant or whatever it is comes to an area. I know I saw this in Indianapolis a lot. Was those incentives and benefits. Can you talk a little bit about how that conversation happens for a listener who maybe even is building a small multifamily property you know, every level of commercial real estate investor can get incentives from, you know, county, city governments. How does that process work? So I'll give you the pitch. So if a company is adding jobs, making a capital investment or adding square footage, then it's time to take a look at a little deeper dive, right? So this is typically for non-retail companies and sometimes not-for-profits will qualify, but most of the time this is other industries. And some industries are, you know, preferred over others. So if you're looking at anything innovative, technology, life sciences, advanced manufacturing, sustainability focused, those are all highly preferred industries. So if you're adding 15 or more new jobs that are meet, that either meet or above your county average wage, you should look at incentives. So typically, and I'm just going to throw this out there. But in friendly states, in states that support incentives, not everyone does. And this is the thing that's confusing. Every state does it differently. Every state has different programs, rules, and regulations. The only constant in this industry is change. Politics affect it. People affect it. And that's always in flux. So that's what makes this difficult. But the Midwest and the Southeast are typically fairly aggressive on incentives. So when I'm working with a client in the Midwest or the Southeast, I'm assigning a value of about $10,000 per new job. A project for me runs three to five years. States do not want to look short term. They want to look at a three to five year picture of growth. So if you're looking at 25 new jobs over a five year period, that's net new jobs over base. So whatever your base is, If that's zero, that's fine. Whatever it happens to be, then I would assign about $250,000 to that project over a five to 10 year period. So it's, I think, if you don't have to pay taxes, don't pay taxes. It gives you an edge, right? It gives you an edge over your competition. Absolutely. Oh, this brings up so many wonderful things. And I'm just going to summarize what I heard from you and go from there. So as you're thinking about what kind of benefits your deal, the project that you're doing, the business that you're bringing to an environment can get in the process. Really, it's like, how many jobs am I creating for that county or that area? How much capital am I bringing to that area? And how much square footage am I adding to that area? So that really gives you a sense of this is what I'm bringing to the community. And then some elements, then there's the innovation part. If you're if you're doing, if you're innovating, if you're changing, if you're going forward, If you're doing something that will move a community forward or give the politicians in that community the feeling that you're moving them forward, that's going to be valuable. And then really the last thing you said there is, you know, thinking about how friendly that environment is to providing incentives. 
everybody wants new business in their space, though, right? Doesn't matter if you're red or you're blue, if you're a Midwestern city or a coastal city, it seems like you would want new business. So, what separates like those places that aren't as friendly? Do they just feel like they have enough there and they don't have to incentivize people coming to them? Or what's the sort of factor that's sitting underneath that? So that's a good question. So if you, I'm just using Indiana because I'm here. We have a lot of cornfields and soybean fields. There's no ocean. There are no mountains. We don't really have any big lakes. So it's flyover. People call it flyover country, right? Or the rust belt, which is sad. But people, we have great people, hard workers, who's your hospitality, all is really you know, low cost of doing business, great, great factors. And we're actually, you know, being quite innovative lately. But then you go to California and they've got ocean and mountains and wonderful things, great quality of life, but they also have super high taxes and lots of rules and regs. They just think they have a great place to live. And if you want to go there, you're welcome to go there, but they're not going to in necessarily entice you to go there. Like it's a great place to live. So if you want to go, great. Now, there are certain kinds of industries that they would support. And perhaps that would be like a solar industry company or an uh, EV company. But for a regular straight up manufacturing company, probably not. But I'm generalizing. There are certain pockets of areas probably in California that have privatized groups that would entice particular companies. But well, that makes sense. I mean, it's a supply and demand thing. If you have a bunch of people who want to go to an area anyway, you don't necessarily have to incentivize as heavily as a place where maybe people perceive as not as attractive to go to. And again, that's part of the commercial real estate story of the Midwest in general is that while we may not be the most attractive place in the world for a variety of reasons, we have low cost of living. We have fairly stable pricing and elements associated with commercial real estate and business in general. So it makes a lot of sense, right? Well, even within Indiana, you're going to have like every city has their own way of attracting, right? Or even counties have their own ways of attracting business. So you're going to find that certain cities are not going to offer or they're going to have certain high thresholds for certain kinds of companies, right? They want only headquarters locations. So they're only going to offer, you know, headquarters locations with 200 or more jobs with $100,000 in salary per new job. That's their minimum. And then you have other locations that might be more rural that would say, hey, we've got an industrial park. We've got land. We'll give it to you. If you move your company here with 50 new jobs that are, you know, $25 an hour. It's that balance. And what you're really talking about is economic development, right? It just depends on the environment, whether it's a big city, more rural, all the things that we're talking about. This is just the economic development capacity of a community. I think a lot of people in the commercial real estate industry, though, don't think about a community's willingness to potentially support you in coming to do your business there. Do you have an example of a project that maybe y'all have done recently where a business was able to get some incentives and really settle in in a way that was inspiring? This isn't necessarily a recent project, but this is like my favorite project of all time. We were able to do a four-state site search for a company out of Taiwan. Uh, It was 300 new jobs. And we did Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois site search. Company had hired a commercial real estate broker as well as our firm to do this. Now, you know, we work cooperatively with commercial real estate brokers, whereas, you know, they're going out trying to find these properties. We are working with communities to find properties that are not necessarily listed. They're community owned, they are redevelopment, they're brownfields, those sorts of properties. So we find a community that has 1 million square foot facility with 350 acres attached. So what had happened is three years prior, a manufacturing company had up and left and they felt bad about it. They'd gone to Mexico and they handed the keys over to the community and said, do with it what you will. We're sorry, we got to leave. And so when we met with this company, we said, listen, we're going to take you to tour this facility. It's a little rough, but the community is willing, a scrappy. 
They love to have you. They want to help you. And no joke, it was raining when we went to this facility. The company had taken the air conditioning units off the roof. So literally there were clouds in the top and rain pouring in. But our company saw the vision, right? They saw the vision and they said, we're going to do this. This is awesome. And so we were able to negotiate that building and that land for one dollar. And we traded that over and we were able to have a scrap company come in, a recycler come in and they went through, took all the metal out and they gave us part of the profits so that we could fix the roof. And that was one of my favorites. It's all about the cooperative nature between the city and the company, right? I mean, that's the perfect, we're trying to create, it's almost like a marriage, right? You're like, you're taking a company and a community, and you're putting them together for a long-time prosperity, right? Long-term. That's such a good story, and it makes so much sense. And I think over the course of this conversation, you're really bringing to surface the idea that it is, if you do this right, it's a marriage. And a lot of listeners might be thinking this is only for large business, but I have a client right now who's doing a deal in Fishers, Indiana, which is, it's like a hundred unit multifamily and retail ground up construction. I think it's like a $30 million project. So it certainly isn't a tiny thing, but it's a pretty reasonable size deal. And they would never have been able to do it without the cooperation of the city, not just for entitlement and the ability to use the land. That's obviously one piece of the conversation, but the incentives that were provided were twofold. One, was grant money to be able to do the work. And the second, maybe most important, was lending. The city actually provided a lending approach where they could have access to money and capital that at a lower interest rate and stuff like that. Is that pretty common to what you see for a lot of deals? Yeah, that is a business-friendly city. Not all cities will do that. That is an app. We love to see that happen. That is a development-friendly city. So cities and states definitely have their own unique ways to support. So real and personal property tax abatement, tax increment financing dollars, low cost, low interest loans. They're all wonderful ways for cities to support companies. At the state level, you have, again, job creation tax credits, which are sometimes refundable, investment tax credits, infrastructure grants to offset the cost of like getting your site ready. So if you have property and you don't have uh, water or gas or electricity running to it, this is a way to, it's like a way that the city, yourself, and the state come together to offset the cost of running those utilities to that property. Yeah. And a lot of those funds, if you really go backwards, go all the way up to the federal government. When you hear about infrastructure and things of that nature, I mean, most of the time, all the federal government doing is doing is providing funds to states, which then provide funds to cities and counties, which then fund things like you're talking about. And so it all really works together. Trickle down effect, right? It's a trickle down effect. (laughs) Absolutely. Okay, so let's say someone's listening. They're like, oh my gosh, I have a deal that I'm really wanting to do, or their mind is being opened by our conversation around what capacity there is for site selection and having that marriage with counties and cities. How do you do it? Like, what's the steps to engage? I guess there are a couple things that I would say. There are steps to engage. The first I would say is in preparation for this. One is these are not statutory incentives. They are discretionary. And that what that means is by legislation, there needs to be competition for these incentives. And so a lot of people make the mistake and they go to the city or the state, to the economic development places, to economic development organizations, and they say, hey, we really love being here so much that we're never going to leave and we want to grow here. And so That just means that they're going to say, welcome, and thanks so much, and great. And you just kind of effectively take yourself out of the the running for any kind of incentive. So the better way to do this, and, and this goes back to, this is back to basics, right? If you are a business and you're putting yourself on the line, you are taking all the risk, then you're an important person, 
right? You're an important person in the community because you're creating a tax base. So if you're creating a tax base, then you're kind of helping to improve the community and the quality of lives around you. So if you know that there are programs in place for just such companies that are doing this, instead of thinking that you're going like hat in hand to say, oh, please, sir, can I have some money? It's more like you're going to the city and or the state and you're saying, hey, look at this awesome thing I'm doing. Look at this, not just this year picture, but look at this five-year plan I have. Take a look at this. And I just want you to know, I don't necessarily have to do this at all. I don't necessarily have to do this in Indiana. I do have clients out of state. My co-founder, founder might be from another state. And I've considered this, but I would really like to give you first shot to take a look at this and tell me how you might support me. Do you have any programs that could offset my cost, that could train my people? I mean, I'm just curious. That's kind of the way. And who do you talk to? You talk to your economic development folks. Go to your city economic development, your county economic development folks, or go to your state economic development folks. And if you have trouble, there are other people that you can ask. But yes, that's where you start. I heard two really great things there, and both of them were around framing. The first thing is how we frame ourselves as business owners, as people who are employing individuals in a city, who are growing a business in the city, who are adding capital, who are adding tax income to a city that we are in value, that we're valuable. And I think that the mindset inside yourself, there's a lot of listeners, and I know including myself sometimes, who have to pump yourself up as far as what the value is that you really bring to your community or to your industry or what you're doing. And I think what the first thing you said or the first thing I heard there was just that idea that, hey, we have to look at ourselves as what we actually are, which is powerful people in a community that are doing the best to lift that community up while also having profitable businesses. And then two, the way that you talk with the economic development community or the folks working at the city or county or whatever it is in your area has a lot to do with how they respond. If you're going hat in hand saying, hey, I heard you got something. Can I get some of it? That's very different than saying, hey, look, here's a value I provide. Again, that comes from the mindset that you started with in the first place. Here's the value I provide. Here's why this is valuable to you. Just wanted to give you an opportunity to be a part of it. It's all around framing, but it makes total sense, right? Absolutely. Well, if you look at what I believe, and I think what most people believe economic development is overall, it's the cooperation between government, businesses, and communities to raise the overall quality of life. So if you look at it that way, then we each have a role to play and we're equally important. So that means we're not necessarily asking for things, right? We're we're definitely giving each other the opportunity to participate. So that's, yeah. And I think when you say tax, you know, we, we always talk about wanting to have less taxes and that's absolutely true. It doesn't mean that we're not contributing to our community as well. Like we're all trying to find the balance that makes sense in there and uh, asking your community to support you so that your employees can come here and support it isn't unreasonable. And I think that's what you said early in our conversation, right? Yeah. And you have to think about it too in a different way. So if you are a young company and you are trying to get your start, it's a competitive atmosphere anyways. It's not difficult. I mean, it's not a, a bad thing to want a little bit of help to get started. Incentives are not meant to be long-term forever things. They're meant to be a short-term offset to help you get started. So even if these short-term, meaning five to 10 years, you're getting a little bit of a break to help you really dig in because this, the cities and states are not in this for the short term. They're in this for the long term, for the long haul. So I think people lose the fact that states see this as a long-term investment. And the other thing I will bring into this is these are typically performance-based. These are not like upfront, here's cash. This is more like here's my plan. This is what I, I think I can do. I'm going to put this in writing. I'm going to sign an agreement that says this is my best effort. And then as I perform over the next few years, I get to what I perform to. So a lot of people do not understand that. So you can't just sign up for an incentive, get a whole lot of money, not perform and walk away. 
Right. So I think that's important. (laughs) So, okay, I got a really good foundation. I think we have a foundation in this conversation of what it means to find a great site, to bring businesses into your community for the economic development of uh, both sides, the business community and the community as a whole. So these last couple questions on on the way out here, just when you look at 2024 and beyond, so the coming you know years, what are you excited about in the world of site selection, in the world of economic development, in the world of growing businesses in the Midwest and beyond? So I think what's happening in site selection, I think we're going beyond the just the the standards, I guess is the best way to say it. The standard number of jobs, capital investment, square footage. And now states and communities are asking, okay, so are you sustainable? Are you giving back to the community? What qualities does your company bring to our community before we decide to support you? Which is kind of an interesting thing. So we, st- I started seeing this really about three years ago And now we're starting to see these questions on applications and applications before we even get to talk to somebody. So it is kind of an interesting change. And I think it's not it's not a bad change. Yeah, it's almost from primarily just fiscal, like primary just money and churn and people and those elements, which are absolutely important and key but also to like cultural or environmental, like how are you really looking at the world as a whole or looking at our community's effect as a whole? And, and that I think that is a good thing. Another thing we're, we're seeing is the remote workforce. States are going to have to decide how incentives and how sites are going to work with this because previous to now, people went to work to a location. And so those were jobs that counted for incentives. And now you have people all over the state and some states have made up their minds. Yes, these jobs count for incentives. And some have said no. And there's a whole bunch that haven't even made up their mind yet. And so being in limbo, is that's a tough space to be. The remote workforce is difficult. Well, maybe this brings you this answer brings us into my next question, which is as you look forward into the next couple of years, what's something that's concerning for you when it comes to site selection? What's something that you're a little worried about? You're keeping an eye on. You just want to understand more and folks who are listening maybe should do the same. I guess there's a the trend right now that we're seeing all across manufacturing is we're seeing workforce kind of being let go you know, up to 20% of workforce across manufacturing companies, a little bit of downsizing. So we're seeing people lose their jobs and that is concerning. And what's happening, what we see happening is along with that, people are buying very expensive, very innovative, advanced machinery. And so this machinery is coming in and which is great, which is wonderful in some ways. And then the workforce that remains, they're getting specialized training. And their wages are going up. So short-term pain in some instances with the loss of jobs. And then on the other side of it, you're seeing innovation and higher training, higher wages. So I don't know if that's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. So you're not seeing loss of jobs because of shrinking businesses. You're seeing loss of jobs because of innovation and technology. Do I have that right? It is outdated technology getting a serious upgrade, which is probably much needed considering we want to remain competitive in the manufacturing industry. And so the light the light at the end of the tunnel of that story is sort of like, while someone may, you know, some of these may be boomers who are aging out anyway. Absolutely. That's a big part of it. And then those folks who are losing jobs, hopefully they have the opportunity to go get some specialized training and come back into that industry or a parallel industry with that new training, maybe that's safer jobs, potentially higher wage and income, and technology actually creates a positive effect over the long term. I mean, technology is going to happen anyway, so that's just kind of a part of it. But if we see that transition, then that's maybe a good thing in the end. Do I have that right? I think so, yes. The last thing I would say, too, is we've seen a lot of billion-dollar deals happening, right? These huge companies coming in like uh, chip manufacturing, everybody's talking about this. And, you know, I would say get ready because we're going to see 
a bunch of suppliers coming in and setting up space around, like go, you know, two, three, four hours out around these huge manufacturing places. So if you're a landowner, get ready. I would say get ready for that. Get some get some infrastructure in place. People are going to come knocking on your doors because this is going to happen. That makes total sense. So if you're seeing a large core manufacturing plant, for example, come into an area, it's reasonable to think over the next five years, you will see satellite elements, manufacturing that serves that larger auto industry is obviously an example. In Indiana, we have Subaru plant. I think we have a few Subaru plants. And then you have other things, other core creators who create parts for those that all feed into that main manufacturing plant when then all where all those parts are put together to create the final product or whatever. Do I have that right? You do. This I'm telling you this is gonna happen. It's already happening. Just take a look at Texas, look at Houston, look at Austin. <laughs> Absolutely. And you're seeing that on the northeast side of Indianapolis. Obviously, you and I have a specific knowledge of Indianapolis. And uh, absolutely seeing that growth happen. And that makes total sense. Okay, last question for you, Jenny. The show is called CRE Clarity. What is one last piece of clarity you have for clients? Something you come back, or for listeners, something you come back to, just a simple piece of advice that you give yourself or you give other people as you're navigating the commercial real estate world. What's one piece of information that you could come back to and our listeners could too as they move forward in a successful commercial real estate journey? I would say just keep an open mind, keep an open mind to possibilities, do your homework, ask lots of questions. I guess even though I think that I researched something out, it always seems like someone knows something more than me. So I'm always, always asking a ton of questions to people who are in the market who probably know something more than I do. I couldn't agree more. I'm on a I'm on a mission myself to take myself more and more out of the key. I mean, obviously I make final decisions in my business because I'm the CEO of the business, but really to listen to more advice and to put A players into spots where they are advising. And it's been just such a dramatic change to have that mindset shift and trust people and elements like that. So I couldn't agree more. Well, if folks want to connect with you, if they want to connect with Sikich, if they want to connect with you to move further in the journey of site selection or other things around economic development, property development, those kinds of things, how can folks find you? Just contact me via email or I've got my phone number. I don't know if you want me to say that on, on the air or not, but I'm available on LinkedIn. <laughs> Folks can find you on LinkedIn. And uh, then if you want to give them your phone number there, that's great. We'll probably do that. Jenny, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. You've opened my mind really around a lot of things in this conversation. I know you've done so for the listeners as well. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today on CRE Clarity. I hope you gained some real insight into how seasoned investors take bigger leaps and have fewer face plans. What's the one insight you'll take away from this episode today? The one piece of clarity that will help you take another step towards your dream of financial freedom. Where are you going to document this new knowledge? How will you apply it? If you're on a walk, send yourself a note. If you're in the car, call a team member and add it to your next meeting agenda. The number one way we fail when learning is to forget. Don't let this clarity go. One way you can commit this clarity to memory is sharing what you've learned on social media. So take a moment now to write a post on LinkedIn, Facebook, X, or wherever your community is. Nothing is better than sharing your insights with friends. And finally, if you got value from this episode or any episode you've listened to so far, please share your opinion by giving us a five-star rating and review. Tell us what you enjoyed about this episode, who you would like to hear on the show in the future, and what topics you hope we address. Your insight is key to helping us provide you more clarity so we can celebrate more wins together. All right, here's to clarity. Have a wonderful day.